You're welcome to this series on ultrasound as part of a course. I'll be taking four different topics, starting with introduction to ultrasound. My name is Anirkan Jacob. This is going to be an abridged version of the whole topic. You have access to related study materials at the end of the course. You also have the full PDF of this presentation. So you can study it later in conjunction with your textbooks and other materials that are available. Uh, this is because we do not have a lot of time to spend on expatiating all the slides that might be there on this presentation. Now, what do we expect that you should know after going through this video lesson? You should understand the physics of ultrasound and how it is applied in medicine. You should understand the basics of ultrasound and also understand how to interpret ultrasound images and result. Talking about the physics of ultrasound, this scares a lot of people when they hear the term physics. Ultrasound physics is um, more or less a practical kind of physics. You can easily understand if you study how the physical principles of sound, sound waves, and the other natural phenomena relate to the production of ultrasound for use in medicine. Now, sound waves are mechanical waves. We already know about that from our basic physics. It's created in the transducer by back and forth displacement. Remember, compression and ray refraction. That's the way sound waves are produced. You have periods of compression and then you have periods of Ray refraction. Sound is generated by a vibrating source. For instance, the tuning fork experiment, you remember that. And sound waves with frequencies greater than 20 kilohertz are what you call ultrasound. Of course, at that level, it's not audible to the human ear. Now, that's why we say that ultrasound is sound beyond the human audible range. Mostly what is used in medical ultrasound is sound that ranges from 1 to 20 megahertz. And it is produced using a transducer, something that we also call the probe. But you find out that the difference that exists between using transducer and the probe is probably in the function. As the name implies, the probe is used as um, a device that you use in checking around, probing. As you scan the abdomen, for instance, you move the probe from one point on the skin to another probing, looking for something. The transducer, on the other hand, is a device that is able to send and receive. Same device, send and receive sound. So the names are used interchangeably sometimes. You have this table that shows different ranges of sound frequency and the applications. There is one important phrase 
that is known and that we use when we looking at ultrasound physics and that is the acoustic impedance it is what determines the amount of sound wave that is transmitted and reflected by body tissues now the opposition that particles in the medium present to acoustic vibration reflection of course when the ultrasound beam hits two tissues that have different acoustic impedance like fluid and fat or fluid and uh, the liver those kind of examples the boundary between those two will always have a difference in impedance and that allows a better reflection of sound in some cases um, a complete reflection in some cases or absorption in other cases all those are caused by acoustic impedance there's a formula for finding this and its density of the medium multiplied by the velocity of the propagating sound you have characteristic acoustic impedance and velocity of sound in a few or in some medium mostly the kind of medium that you will see in the human body which includes air, fat, water, blood, kidney, liver, muscle and skull this help in most cases to determine what organ is seen better on ultrasound for instance between air and water which one transmits sound more which one absorbs sound more which one reflects sound more those are easily known once you know the acoustic impedance now let's continue our discourse on the physics of ultrasound the major element that is present in the transducer is what we call the piezoelectric element there are a few of them and these elements have the ability to convert energy from one form to another in the case of ultrasound electrical energy into mechanical sound waves and then it when the reflection of sound takes place in the body the same element is able to convert it back to electrical signals signals which is what you actually see as a display on the ultrasound screen that is what we call the piezoelectric effect the ability of a particular chemical element to act both as the transmitter and the receiver of sound waves as applied in ultrasound now having known that a typical uh, we will realize that a typical ultrasound machine or ultrasound unit is made to be able to perform this function of sending out sound waves to the body and then when the sound waves reflect from deep inside the tissues according to the differences in acoustic impedances the reflected sound is also received converted to electrical signals and displayed on the ultrasound monitor that's what the ultrasound unit does that's why they are made up of several components and accessories there in today's ultrasound you need of course the storage is important the monitor or the cpu the, sorry the monitor or the vdu that's the visual display unit you also have sometimes camera multi-format camera and videotape or recorder or printer you can have external video display devices connected to the ultrasound machine too uh, as at now, as at this time in practice, 
we have portable ultrasound the ones that we simply call laptop style ultrasound machines that are easily carried about it has both the system unit and the monitor right in one portable device and then you have the port where you attach the transducer some transducers today are even um, wireless such that you can connect to the main unit without needing a cable these are different types of machines you have today the portable the trolley system and a um, variety of builds variety of control panels variety of knobs technology has made it possible that by today you have tens and hundreds and thousands of varieties as far as buying an ultrasound equipment is concerned all that you need to know is how you want to use your equipment what area of medicine you want to apply your equipment that will help you to know what to acquire for instance in the case of our uh, course at this time along the line we are going to discuss breast ultrasound um, ultrasound guided guided breast uh, biopsy so you can see a biopsy needle attached to a probe and this is a setup that goes together to allow the physician to drain or take any form of sample from deep inside the body by ultrasound guidance. I already explained about transducers and probes. We can briefly look at a few types or a few forms of transducers and probes that we have. There is the linear, of course, along the line we'll also look at the linear again because it's the one we recommend for use in breast ultrasound. The images are rectangular when you place it on the body. It has a higher frequency generally, might range from 7.5 or higher megahertz and it's mostly for superficial structures uh, it gives one dimensional view and uh, sometimes it is just called a vascular probe it is easily used to do vascular studies because most uh, blood vessels are a bit superficial as compared to deeper structures when structures lie deep in the body, covilinear probes are used mostly. They have shorter, um, lower frequencies because in ultrasound, the lower the probe frequency, the deeper the uh, ultrasound beam can penetrate. The higher the probe frequency, then the shallow, the shallower the depth that the ultrasound beam can penetrate. So it has generally low frequency that I've stated, like I've stated, gives a wider angle of view because it is curved. The higher the frequency, the better the resolution. Of course, the better the resolution, the better you can distinguish objects from each other now these are a range of probes that of course you may have seen this or will eventually see it as you practice ultrasound you have the convex the linear the first array more like the linear more like the convex but it has a smaller footprint smaller surface area micro convex the same thing you have endocavitary probes ones for maybe transvaginal transrectal Ocephagial, those ones that can be inserted through the esophagus, the different kinds of probes. 
Now the footprint, if we use the term the footprint relating to the probe, we simply mean the surface area that makes contact with the patient. The covilinear transducers come with different footprints for different purposes. Now you can see examples of images derived from the different transducer types that we looked at. The image on the left, even when the structures are about the same, in this case the testicles, you can see that what you get from the linear is sharper than what you get from the covilinear. But the covilinear covers a wider area than the linear. You can see the difference there. This is an image gotten from a transvaginal probe, an endovaginal probe, an endovaginal transducer, anyhow you want to call it. Of course, it has a wider angle of view than the other probes. And you can see the view. This is an image from a probe with a smaller footprint. You can see that at the top, the angle is very small and then it goes wider towards the outskirt of the image. Small sector array probe is what is used here. Now it's important to learn the knobs on your ultrasound machine. One ultrasound machine might have a few more knobs than another and then maybe they might perform slightly different functions but generally most knobs on the ultrasound machine are common between machines. Take for instance the freeze button. On every ultrasound machine you always have to freeze the image which means once you have scanned and you see an image the way you want it, you freeze it. The on off button is the preset, the depth, focus, time gain, compensation, the TGC. Now with the frequency these days you have the possibility of using the same probe but varying the probe frequencies. One probe can have three different um, frequency domains like a covilinear probe with a 2.5 frequency. You can press the button a knob on the machine and select and change it to 3.5 and then change it to 5 megahertz. For the same probe it is now obtainable in most machines. Now, some of the knobs are explained. I think um, as you go through your slides, you will see most of the functions of these knobs. The power button is to put on and put off your ultrasound machine. It is very important so that you don't have your equipment damaged. You need to know how many buttons are there. Most equipment may have two power buttons or more, maybe one behind, another one in front. You have to know the sequence of putting it on and putting it off. You have the gain setting, which is important. It helps you to amplify the received ultrasound signal. Now, when the overall gain knob is turned to the right side, the received signal is magnified and more received signals are allowed to be processed. You can also turn it anti-clockwise and it does the opposite function. You can adjust the depth on your ultrasound machine. You want to see deeper tissues, you can adjust to see deeper tissues. You want to see tissues that are more superficial, you can adjust the depth to see tissues that are more superficial. You have the caliper which you the, the they help you to measure length or measure um, 
any form of measurement including diameters including circular measurements you use the calipers you have the mode buttons and the freeze button of course the mode button you can change to Doppler you can change to 4d or 3d if your machine has 3d you can change to M mode you can change to B mode or change to cardiac mode whatever mode that is available on your equipment the freeze button as I said earlier helps you to make an image static and then you can print or record these are examples of images showing how some of these knobs are used like, like the time gain compensation allows you to adjust image brightness at a certain depth so you can see images becoming brighter or darker depending on what you adjust the gain controls overall brightness of the image um, i already talked about the frequency you look at these images very well you can see the differences in frequencies as they affect the images the focus will allow you to focus the ultrasound beam to a particular area of interest in this case there is a cyst the round object at the center and that's the essence of the focusing we want to see the cyst very well the depth can also be adjusted you can see that the third image the image on the right it shows the cyst bigger and clearer than for instance the image on the left because the image on the right the depth has been adjusted such that we see more superficial whereas the image on the left we see deeper and our point of interest tends to come too close to the top now we look at scan and patient orientation when you are doing ultrasound just like your regular anatomy ultrasound is not different you learn to know what positions to place patient when you are performing certain exams you can scan a patient lying supine or the right lateral decubitus where the patient lies on the right side the patient can be prone lying on the belly and the patient can lie on the left side the left decubitus you can have patient on oblique positions you can have patient on semi erect or semi recumbent positions the left posterior oblique and sitting position um, you can even have patient standing sometimes depending on what you want to look at a typical ultrasound exam has the patient lying supine on a couch and the sonographer sits on the patient's right side and the ultrasound screen faces the sonographer the probe has a marker which should point towards the patient's head during longitudinal scanning well some people would say it should point down but whatever you have chosen to use you have to master it so that when you are looking at the screen because it's not possible for you to be looking at the probe and the screen simultaneously so when you're looking at the screen while you are, the, your hand is working on the probe you should be able to know what you are seeing on the screen based on the probe marker now in a longitudinal scan plane the left to right of the sonographer's monitor corresponds to the patient's cranial caudal anatomy when you are sitting and looking at the monitor and you are scanning in a longitudinal plane the your left hand if your left hand touches the left well the left to you of the screen which is actually like the right of the patient on the screen that will be the patient's head 
whereas your right which is the far right of the screen which is actually the left to the patient will show the caudal part of the patient when you are doing a transverse scan of course the left of your screen is the patient's right and the right of your screen is the patient's left you have to understand that orientation now diagrammatically it is shown here top of the screen is the skin bottom of the screen is the deeper structure that you are scanning left of the screen is the patient's cranial part and right of the screen is the patient's caudal part Transverse scan is the same skin above, deeper structure below, and then left of the screen, that's your left hand, is patient's right, and your right hand is patient's left. This is demonstrated with some anatomical structures. You can see the iota being shown on this image with the transducer held longitudinally. You can see the small green point on this transducer pointing up, that is the probe marker. And you can see the ultrasound image and how it is um, placed. To the left is cephalic. To the right is the caudal end. For transverse image, exactly the way we explained. Now, some other terminologies that are applied in ultrasound, you need to know terms that describe ultrasound images. So when you scan and you're reporting, you get used to the terms that you use. You call ultrasound um, images, ultrasound uh, whether they are pathologies or normal tissues, you call them by ultrasound names. You use sonographic terminologies, not just any word that you choose. So you have homogeneous, or homogeneity, and it simply shows a tissue that has uniform texture. We're looking at the liver here on the left and the kidney that's the right kidney on the same image. Uh, you can see that they almost appear like the same thing, except for the central portion of the kidney. The outer portion of the, cut, the kidney cortex and the liver have the same echo nature, and then we we'll say they are homogeneous. Now, heterogeneity or heterogeneous or uh, heterogeneity will have to do with various degrees of echogenicity. Now, this is the liver. We're looking at the liver alone here, but you have multiple nodules um, that are hyper echogenic compared to other areas of the liver that are just hypo echogenic and so this is multiple echogenicity both the high echo and the low echo are present in the same organ so we say this is heterogeneous you have here again the liver and the right kidney both appearing so echogenic like you not really differentiate between both of them and uh, even though there are different structures, we say this is isoechoic, two tissues with the same amount of echogenicity. You have the hyperechoic, the uh, echogenic tissues. I've already mentioned this, but in explanation, we say that when a structure appears brightly, it is hyperechoic. When it is um, less bright or dark you say it is hypo echoic you see the image on the left hyper 
if you compare it with the image on the right, the image on the right is will be hypo. And here it is the hypo echoic image, or sometimes people use echopenic. It has low level echoes, and you can see that the liver or the cortex of the kidney has low level echoes compared to the renal pelvis, which has high level echoes. You also have the term anechoic. Um, you have to understand the difference between saying that it is hypoechoic or hypoechogenic, whatever, or saying it is anechoic. When it is hypo, that means low echo, but when it is anechoic, it means it is completely without internal echoes and it mostly applies to fluid like urine in the bladder or ascitic fluid or some other fluid like a cyst. This is the urinary bladder and it's completely without internal echoes and so it is anechoic. We also have um, criteria for describing masses that you might encounter in ultrasound like uh, the simple cyst, completely rounded, completely anechoic. Uh, you have the hypoechoic mass, which is more like the simple cyst, but it's just that the echo is low. It's not, it's not completely absent, like in water or like in a cyst. This is just low echo. It could be a solid mass. And you have a complicated cyst, which will be a mixture, a mixture of both the solid parts and the liquid and the fluid parts you have lobulated cysts it will just have lobules you have loc loculated cysts which will have fluid inside fluid or well, yeah it will have locules of fluid fluid collection in larger maybe smaller fluid collection in larger fluid compartment you have abscess um homogeneous masses you have heterogeneous masses maybe both um, hyperechoic areas and hypoechoic areas and you have masses that infiltrate they eat into other organs so example of the simple cyst is completely anechoic you have the complicated cyst you can see areas of um, solid in areas that are of solid nature you have septation the septas that divide the masses into compartments and then you have fluid field areas this is just a complex or a mixed pattern of cystic solid fluid debris blood and um, other matters that might be present this is a lobulated cyst of course well defined with thin septa and increased through transmission it is not the border is not regular that's why it says it's lobulated it's a kind of zigzag and then inside in and out in and out you have a loculated cyst well defined with thick septa you can see several pockets of fluid that stand alone and then when you put it together when you put them together it makes the larger cystic structure but the larger cystic structure now has smaller components abscess has um, irregular borders and has debris within the sound transmission may or may not be increased. You see this in the liver, in the spleen, and other places. When a mass is infiltrating, it distorts the architecture and the border is irregular and tra the sound transmission decreases. As you can see, this is an infiltrating mass. Now, artifact. 
is something that is common to almost all the medical imaging fields, whether it's X-ray, CT, MRI, and ultrasound is not different. When you have something appearing in a, an image that is not supposed to be there, whether it is something that is actually there or something that mimics something that is not there or equipment fault that introduces something external to the image or to the body part being imaged. You call those artifacts. That means in the real sense, if you were to open up that part of the body at that time, what you probably saw on the ultrasound screen is not in the anatomy. So it's an artifact. Now, what causes this object between um, this, this first artifact is uh, what we just call shadowing. You can see that there is a stone in the gallbladder when the ultrasound beam gets to that, uh, reaches that stone, the beam is completely reflected. It doesn't pass through. And so the area beyond or the area behind that stone becomes dark. We call it posterior acoustic shadowing. And it presents as um, an artifact. Now, the opposite of what we just looked at, the opposite of shadowing is enhancement. The other one happens when there is a solid um, a structure a calcified structure in most cases or bones that completely reflect the sound beam. Now on the other hand when the sound beam meets a structure that is anechoic and it is completely transmitted the sound completely passes through. The other side of that structure becomes brighter or enhanced and so we call it posterior acoustic enhancement and it happens mostly with anechoic cystic structures you have the refraction artifact which is uh, which alters the direction of the beam the direction of sound travel assumed to be the direction of the sound transmitted you have a structure and uh, maybe because of difference in angle of the beam transmission when it gets to that structure it tends to duplicate it and so you can look at them and they seem like they are two or double structures it is actually the principle of refraction that creates the other image when you man manipulate your probe and adjust your angle a bit you see that it is just one structure you have reverberation or multiple echo artifacts it's what they call the comet tail effect and has dozens of multiple reflections between the transducer and the reflector because of that you have mirror images of the structure that you are actually looking at for instance, the image will appear 1 cm into the body and then when it reflects back to the transducer, it now serves as a second image and is reflected again. So at the end of the day, you can have an image in A and then it returns back 
to an image in B, which is actually the artifact. In this case, uh, hemangioma is what is causing that. For this and the previous artifact we discussed, like I said, you can adjust your angle and uh, manipulate your probe so that you don't make a mistake of reporting them as two separate structures. You have the resolution artifact, um, axial and lateral resolution limitations the result in failure to resolve two adjacent structures as being separate structures. You see, we see this a lot as ultrasound machines get older or the probes have issues, which is why um, quality assurance is very important. You're seeing two separate structures, but maybe due to poor resolution, poor lateral resolution, the ultrasound probe is not able to differentiate the structures as being two separate structures. And so it causes this kind of image that you are seeing. You may have to refocus and then tweak your probe a bit otherwise with quality control the probe might need to be changed now i hope you learned one or two things and i hope by the time you take the post test having taken the pre-test before you started you would have made a difference from maybe the answers you gave when you first took the test before you took the lesson read your slides read the materials that are given in the end and then I wish you good luck as we progress in the course. Thank you.